You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. It's another one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcast today with Vet Physio Felicity Paris from the UK. Now, one of the things I love about these interviews is that Vet Rehabbers share with us their wins and their losses. And although it's not great that they made mistakes, when they share them with us, we get to learn from them. So when we find ourselves in that same position, we have hindsight, which we would never have had before. So you get to fast track your success by not repeating the same mistakes that other Vet Rehabbers make. Felicity chats to me about the challenges of running a practice with a young family, how she has partnered with another vet physio to help her client with her client demand, and how she juggles her time between family consults and teaching others in the vet rehab world. Now, if you own your own practice and you want some tips and advice on how to market your vet rehab practice, we have a great download called 12 Free Ways to Market Your Vet Rehab Practice. Online Pet Health members, you can log into the members portal and go to the business basics area and get that PDF. If you're not a member, you can download it from our free area. All you need to do is go to onlinepethealth.com forward slash 12 free ways and that's 12 the number and you can get your copy. I'll repeat that www.onlinepethealth.com forward slash 12 the number free ways and you can download the PDF there. Before I head over to my chat with Felicity, a quick word from our sponsors. PulseVet are the global leaders in veterinary shockwave technology. They manufacture the ProPulse and Versatron family of products. Now, for those of you that don't know, shockwave therapy is a non-invasive, high-energy sound wave therapy that can be used on both large and small animals to treat multiple soft tissue and musculoskeletal conditions. With over 20 years of clinical research, PulseVet is used by top vets and vet rehabbers to improve the quality and speed of healing, relieve pain, stimulate bone and tissue growth, and improve mobility for their patients. For more info, you can go to PulseVet.com. You can also meet the PulseVet team at the Vet Rehab Summit, which is on the 13th of November. Um, It's our online veterinary rehabilitation conference. So over to my chat with Felicity. Hey, Felicity. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. Felicity, why don't you tell the listeners about yourself and how you got into the field of vet rehab? So uh, ever since um, a young age, I always knew I wanted to work with animals, mainly horses, because I was brought up with horses. I started riding at the age of four, but as all young girls do, want to be around horses 24-7. And then it came down to picking a university and what I wanted to do. And my mum always guided me towards what she said was a proper job. <laughs> so, so she wanted me to go to university get a degree and not pursue my ambitions in the horsey field. However, I didn't have a clue of what I wanted to do with horses. All I knew is that I wanted to work with animals. So I went off and did my um, undergraduate degree. And lo and behold, when I was doing that in the first year, I heard of a lady called Mary Bromley, who was a founder of um, physiotherapy in horses way back when she started her massage courses and I knew that then that was for me that was a path for me so my focus then was on finishing the um, human course and then going straight on into the masters yeah to practice with animals. So I have a similar story I was also a horse rider and um, I remember when I was probably about standard eight, so it's like 15 or 16, you know, 15 probably. And I remember saying to my mom and to my riding instructor, no, I'm just going to ride horses. And I've got a daughter. My youngest daughter is exactly the same. And you ask her what she wants to be. She said, I'm going to be a horse rider. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be. I think it's all little girls at horse ride. It's always their dream. Um, and then we have to branch out into other things. I mean, there's no problem with being a horse rider, right? Um, nice. Doing something. But um, yeah, my, my mom was exactly the same. You need a degree or some type of qualification behind your name. And then you, you can, yeah, she's quite happy for me to go back into horse riding. And my so. mom said, you can do it as a hobby. And I remember turning around saying, no, it's going to be my job. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. nothing better than riding horses all day. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> So how does practice look for you now? So currently I'm practicing part-time. Um, I've just had my second child. So I've got a daughter who's eight months who was born in between the two lockdowns. So that was a little bit hairy, scary over here in the UK. Um, but everything's fine now and settled down. So I'm working part-time. 
um, I have an established um, small and large animal practice, um, which has been up and running for about 10 years. So luckily I have had some established clients behind me and they've all been great and supportive with the new baby coming along. Um, and I've also just um, employed a new graduate who graduated last summer. So she is helping out massively with the clients. Um, yeah, but it never stops. And also you, I don't, I feel like when you're self-employed, you don't really, really want to stop sometimes I mean you have that little bit of rest but then you're back out there and um, you're in the thick of it yeah so obviously when you went on maternity leave you didn't have your current um, help um so how, how did you handle maternity leave? because I think that's one of the big things for us as vet we have is especially if you don't have um, anyone else in your team and, um, you know, you go and have a baby and me, myself now, I'm like six months pregnant. So also about to have a baby. And I can recall, you know, having my kids when I had my practice and I was in practice. Um, there isn't really such a thing as maternity leave, right? You just have to keep working. And I mean, I had a, I was lucky enough to get a locum to cover me, but there were still loads of practice things that I had to do. Um, yeah. And I recall sort of the three week old baby you know, in the practice, in the office, you know, sitting there tapping my foot on, on, on the car seat, trying to get the baby to sleep while I was tapping on the computer and having meetings and things. So how did it work for you? Well, I actually had one of my clients said <clears throat> I was due to see her horses every six to eight weeks and it fell just as I was going to give birth. And she said to me, don't worry, I'll come and pick you up <laughs> just to come and see her luckily we managed to swing that one I saw them just before I gave birth but yes it is difficult and I think this time around actually was easier so Darcy is my second child the first um one was a little bit of uh ups and downs and but it's always been an unwritten rule between me and my husband that actually he um has to have the baby one at least one day a week so um now I'm back up and running only two days where he has the childcare. But yeah, um, I think with Darcy, I was back out seeing people after about three weeks. So it was quite quick, but I feel like on the other hand, sometimes for, for me, it was my sanity really as well. Getting back to some normality, getting my head back in gear and being on right. This is my, it's almost my time as well. And seeing clients and chatting with my regular clients and, you know, it's, it, because it encompasses you the business doesn't it it is part of you yeah. and yeah and it almost feels like when you're not doing it you're not you <laughs> yeah. that makes sense. You yeah there's something missing you yeah. know you feel like like I need to do something you know you can't help yourself yeah so how many days a week are you practicing now so the, I'm only doing two days a week now yeah okay so those two days are you flat out you know, trying to maximize. Out, yeah. yeah. So how many yeah. patients would you see? So it depends where they are. So I cover quite a large area, but, um, and it depends if they're horses or, or just the smaller animals. So um, usually about six or seven um, in okay. a day. Yeah. I try, I do try and get back. I like to get back for um, <clears throat> sort of bath time. Yeah. That's my aim, whether it happens or not. Different matter. <laughs> That's my aim. And then on the other days when you've got baby, are you able to catch up on admin and do other things? Um, yes, although now she's starting to get a bit more active. It's getting more difficult. Um, so I have to do it in nap times on the, the old phone. If I have to take her for a drive for a nap, <laughs> then it's on the old uh, iPhone, do my emails and, and replying to clients. And then luckily, now that I've got, you know, second pair of hands I can refer quickly the text to to my yeah. next pair of hands and she can call and she can get the consent and she can go forward with those so it has been a bit easier bringing her on board yeah and so your assistant when when does she work so is she working the days that you're not working or is she no so she is part-time in the NHS so that's our national health service here in the UK being a human physio and then she she's building up her own practice and what we've got together is that she she <clears throat> I refer the cases that I can't fit in my diary to her um, and then she gets a percentage so she can fit them in whenever when whenever it suits her in her diary um, so that's easier than me blocking out sort of 
you know, having to fill her day as such. If I've only got two, I can give her a week, then she can fill other clients around it, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So you don't have the commitments of having to pay her salary. If she sees a patient of yours, do you invoice them and then give her a percentage? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So at the minute they pay me through the, through the business and then she invoices me at the end of the month for every patient she's seen. So at the end of the week, she'll tell me who she's seen so I can keep track of, um, track of them and make sure that their payment has come in through the business and then at the end of the month, she invoices me for the amount um, that we've agreed that she's going to get for each patient. Great. And are you mainly feeding her new clients or yes. older clients of yours? Mainly new clients because um, I tried once before with having someone on board and um yeah, older clients like to stick to who they know and they like that you know their animals and you know the history inside out, really, which is understandable. Um, and, you know, you've got that rapport and you, you've got that working relationship, haven't you? So, yeah, so this time I've stuck to new new people and, um, yeah. And then how does it work with her creating her own practice? Because, you know, obviously if you're feeding her new clients if those clients maybe see her and then they have three months break and then come back, do they always contact you or could they maybe contact her and then you might theoretically lose that client? Yeah, so that is one of the disadvantages of it because they've never met me in person. They've always just had the initial contact and conversation with me where I, where I always say, you can wait for me, but my diary is full until then. Or... I've got someone else who can take over and be in with you quite soon. Um, so that's the only initial contact that they've had with me usually. So it is, it's all done on based on trust really. Um, it, in our conversations, when I decided to bring her on board, that was one of the things that I did state that the clients stay with me. Um, she feeds back about them to me. Um, yeah, but I think that that is um, one difficulty of it. Yeah, I think especially if you're building client bases in the same area. Um, but these are how partnerships start, right? Yeah, So you exactly. work out this and, you know, you guys might go into like a full partnership, um, which will work really well. Has, has your assistant got kids too? No, no. So she is fancy free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that helps especially with you with your two kids um if you've got a sick kid then you can always get her to to help and i mean generally um when people start in the human field and they start to move over into the animal field and um, it sounds like she's trying to expand the the animal side of things it happens quite quickly before she knows that she probably won't be treating any human patients no i know i said to her i said are you prepared to be really busy <laughs> And she was like, bring it on. <laughs> yeah. So did you, you obviously originally also saw human patients and now you're 100% animals, right? Yes. And every time I go out to see, so I used to see people privately. So then I used to get to somewhere and we'd be doing the, um, the mum, the dad, and I did pediatrics for a while. So I could see the child and then I could see the dog and the horse. So it was like an old day at one, <laughs> one person's house. <laughs> classic yeah so, now anyone when everyone asks me I try and swerve that question on people yeah I remember actually at my practice some of the owners used to say oh you should have a massage therapist for the for the owners um, yeah. so when their dogs are in the treadmill or having treatment then they can also have treatment at the same time and um, what you can't do is when you're watching a horse and they're moving their or their dog up and down you can't take your eyes off the person and you're thinking Oh, oh, they need some treatment. Yeah, exactly. to focus on but they're so wonky. They're just wonkier than the dog. <laughs> Sometimes. So um, tell me about the equipment that you have. Have you made any investments in any sort of modalities like laser or shockwave or anything like that? Yeah, so I use laser, um, H-wave, um, muscle stim. So I've got a few little muscle stim machines which actually were really handy when I first started out. So they were sort of the, the first purchase that I bought because they aren't um, expensive like some of the other pieces of equipment and they're so versatile. You can use them on the horses, you can use them on the dogs. 
um yeah so they were really nifty bit of kit so those are the things that I always sort of <clears throat> tell people about if they ask me oh what did you start out with or what do you recommend I get um is that is the little neuro track muscle stims I, I I like to use but I have got a laser and um an ultrasound too yeah and then all the bits of balance equipment and stuff like that and um, were you nervous to make the investments in those pieces of equipment? Because I think it's something that, you know, everyone starts off with just themselves and then they start building up that equipment. And it's always a big decision um, to purchase one of the modalities, especially if it's quite pricey. What were your feelings sort of when you were thinking about it? And how do you feel now that you've invested in, in those pieces of equipment? Yeah, so it did take me a long time to invest in a bigger piece of equipment because I was so in love with my muscle stim. I just used it all the time and I was so versatile, like I said, and it did take me a while to invest in. But I think when you um, see other therapists using other stuff and then you start looking into the research and you start um, hearing of people's um, reactions, so clients' reactions to other bits of equipment it starts to make you think although obviously you want to be purchasing stuff that's going to be evidence-based towards your treatment um you know a lot of people do like some sort of gadget um but what I did when I decided to purchase my next bit purchase my next bit of equipment was um <clears throat> every case that I saw so it was for over maybe a month um I thought would I be able to use that bit of equipment with this case um, successfully, more successfully than I would with my, what I've got already. So that sort of made my reasoning to buy, to purchase um, a further bit of equipment. And are you charging um, to use that individual piece of equipment or do you just charge a general consult fee? <clears throat> no, so I just charge a general consult fee because I feel like it's part of our toolbox, isn't it? So you're never going to know what you're going to use out of your toolbox until you've done your assessment. And to have more things in your toolbox, um, you're more likely to have an effective um, session or effective sort of um, rehab program. So I don't charge extra, although sometimes if I do, I hire out the muscle stims. So for the post-op, canines mainly um, and if I feel like the owners are going to be confident and competent using it then I will um, charge sort of a minimal weekly fee for them to have it and put it into their program. Yeah and I think also I mean I was exactly the same so I used to have a standard consult fee because I think that a lot of our clients um, and especially <coughs> the small number of clients they like to be able to budget so they want to know how much is it going to cost them over the next month. So you plan to treat their pay, their dog twice a week for the next four weeks. Um, it's really difficult to budget for them because you don't know what you're going to use until you've seen the patient and to see you know where it is. So when you have it all sort of grouped under, this is just a one-off consult fee. Yeah. And then depending on that day and the patient at that, that time, what you're going to use and how you're going to treat them. Yeah. Um, it's easier for them, I think. And easier for us to, I think, just it makes uh, invoicing complicated. But I think the thing is, is then, um, you know, does that piece of equipment pay for itself? Um, and I must say, I also used to find the same thing with pet owners. They like it when you've got some gadgets. Um, <laughs> so not that you need them, but they like it, you know. Yeah. When they see that you're using something um, different, then they're like, oh, well, like, that this must be working, you know, and it's a bit like, like they like that the same with blood tests, you know, you can, you can diagnose something in from clinical examination, and then you confirm it with the blood test. And when they can see the numbers or see something, yeah, you know, vision. If, yeah, yes, and they see that it's working, you know, yeah. Um, and I suppose with our human, you know, when you have a human patient, you've got the feedback from them, whereas the dog unless they, uh, the dog or horse, unless they have improved in lameness that the owner can see, because often they can't, right? It's yeah. a subtle improvement that we can see or yeah. on palpation, we can feel, wow, this animal is so much better. And you yeah. tell them that and you can see them sometimes looking at you thinking, well, you know, I can't feel it. So <laughs> when they see you're working on some equipment, you know, using a modality, 
it, it does give them sort of a little bit of boost and they think, well, I'm getting my money's worth here. Yeah. And also, I don't know um, about anyone else, but I would find it really hard just to stick if I was going to go in and just do laser just do laser and not advise on anything else or not teach another you know because the conversation goes on about oh I've been doing the exercises can you teach me you know and then it, it adds on and then it's a whole a whole you know holistic um, assessment then isn't it and, or consultation so you never can stick just to laser and charge just for that because you're going to be saying other stuff or doing other stuff without yeah. realizing yeah. mainly because that's what we like we what we want to don't we we want to you know uh, help and um, give advice and yeah support yeah. our owners yeah so I think for myself as my as my uh, practice grew organically like I couldn't d- directly say this piece of equipment paid for itself and um, but I do feel that whenever I did buy equipment I did see growth in my practice generally, you know, um, so referrals and um, so very indirect. You couldn't, I couldn't really ever say I bought this piece of equipment and it paid for itself within a certain number of months. Yeah, because we don't get specific referrals, do we, from like um, the vets for like just want laser or just want ultrasound? Because that would be more helpful in a way when we're thinking about if it's going to pay for itself, if we were getting specific asks, but we're not, we don't, do we? So it's more difficult to track. Yeah, no, exactly. But I do think that we do need to consider what equipment we've got um, and if we're charging appropriately. So I think that that's one of the things that vet rehabbers, in my experience of mentoring uh, vet rehabbers, is that they undercharge. So they undersell themselves a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't have a standard like this is how much we should charge. And so what people generally do is they look at other people in their yeah. area or other people in the market and they're looking at the people who are undercharging <laughs> their clients and then they just come in at that. And once you come in at a price, it's really difficult then to increase your price, you know, to where it should be. It take it'll take a, you know a few years or you know, every six months you can maybe increase your price. And then um, again, it's confidence, isn't it, to then tell people that now this is what I'm charging, especially if they've been having that price for a while. It's yeah. like, right, I, I don't know if I want to mess up our relationship by saying that, but like you said, yeah, we need to be telling ourselves because we, you know, we're, we've we got great skills and, you know, we should be charging for it. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, we've actually got some great, a great training um, in our business basics area on our online pet health members platform all about this like are you charging enough and what to do about it so how to increase your prices so our online pet health members you guys can um, go and check that out and if you're not a member you can check out onlinepethealth.com and have a look at it so let's move on to the marketing side of things and um, because this is often an area where we don't have a lot of time right we are consulting virtually most of the day and especially with you treating horses and there's a lot of wasted time, right, when you're driving because you're, you know, you're spending, I don't know how many hours a day, if you know how many hours a day you spend on the road. No, I don't know. A lot of hours and a lot of miles. So when I went to get my new car, they ask you, how many miles are you going to do? We get you insurance, don't you? And how many miles do you want a year? And it was like, well, better bump it up a bit <laughs> to the average, not the average, but double the average. <laughs> yeah. So when do you find time to market? I mean, I must say now you it's probably a little bit easier because you've got those days where you're looking yeah. after baby, but still there's lots of admin to do in the sleeping time, right? Um, so what is your marketing plan now? Where do you get most of your clients from? Um, and what do, you, what, what do you spend? How many hours a week are you spending on marketing? So it is much easier now also because I'm a bit more established than when I was starting out. So I don't have to do as much because usually it goes on word of mouth and I have, you know, the clients that I've worked with for a while, they have um, their yards or they have their, you know, um, one's a um, coach. So she goes to different yards and, she, you know, and she will always spread the word. So it is a bit easier now with regards to it's more word of mouth but um, and also now um, because of social media. So I do um, post on sort of the horse forums and things like that um, to advertise with regards to the small animals. I don't find that as the same as in 
um, horses with regards to the online stuff with clients. Um, the, the small animal stuff is through the work that I've done previously and building up a reputation more so on that side with regards to getting re-referrals. So um, when I first started out, um, I did a, um, set a letter to all my local um, practices and offered to go in and do a talk about physio and about what I could offer and what my service was and what, what I did really. So that really established me with some of the practices at first. And luckily a lot of them have um, stuck around and they, you know, they refer to me. Um, and then when I've got referrals from larger small animal hospitals that are further away, but their clients live near me, um, then building up a rapport with that um, referrer and that consulting vet and making sure that you're feeding back um, your assessment findings and what your plans are and things like that, then that, that sticks in their mind. And then, then they remember you for the next time. And, and yeah, and then the referrals become easier. So mainly through word of mouth, but also through some vet referrals. And it is easier once you're established because yeah. then you have those relationships, right, with the veterinary practices. Um, yeah. Are you doing any paid advertising at the moment? No paid. The only thing that I paid for was flyers and um, flyers and my website. Yeah. So with regards to that, um, and not that I use them that often. I did a few local horse shows and dog shows, and I sponsored a few classes as well in the beginning, um, which also helped. Um, yeah, but mainly it's through word of mouth or you get messages, my friend recommended you or, yeah, or I'm having my horse done and there's a couple on the yard that need doing. Can you, you know, fit them in too? Things like that, really. How do you work um, with your assistant that's working with you? How do you work the vet reports that she needs to do? So we always do a vet report after our initial consult, and that goes back to the referring vet. So she has been doing those. Um, she, not all the time, but she does um, fly them past me if she, she wants some feedback on how she's laid it out or how, she, you know, what she, how she's worded it and what her plan is. So in a way, it's quite nice for her actually working alongside someone as well, where she's first newly graduated. It gives her a bit of confidence, um, you know, with all the systems and what to say and what to write and, and um, the support with regards to um, the treatment plans and stuff. And are you, are you having to give her quite a lot of clinical support or are you feeling that she's sort of finding her feet quite quickly? She's finding her feet quite quickly. I was luckily lucky enough to have her as one of my students. So I do take students from um, a couple of the vet um, physio courses over here in the UK. And she was one of my students. So I did know her practice and sort of guided and mentored her um, initially. Um, we check in weekly with each other, which is helpful. Um, and I also... Um, have had some feedback from some of her clients so where I've had the initial contact with them then they some of them have fed back to me about um about her sessions which has been lovely because it's all been positive and um so that's really nice to know because sometimes it can be a bit daunting handing over things because ultimately it's your name isn't it it's your reputation it's your business um yeah so that's how we've worked it yeah, I mean, it's really scary. I mean, I can remember even just employ employing people to work with me. Um, and I think maybe in the mobile sense, it's actually easier because when you're in a practice together and, you know, I'm there and the other person's there, it's so much easier just to say, no, I want to see Megan. Um, you know, and I had the problem where clients, you know, I'd have vets that would refer to me and then they would tell the clients, you must see Megan. <laughs> So, oh. yeah, so, so, um, and then, uh, you know, I just ended up, I remember, you know, employing people and they would just sit most of the time while I worked like seeing 13, 14 patients a day. Um, and it was only actually when I went on maternity and actually was able to pull away and get, get away that, um, you know, the, my assistant actually was able to start her own client base 
And then there were clients that just wanted to see her, which was great. Um, but it takes a while and it takes you actually taking that step back. So it's sort of a bit, in your case, you know, they don't really have an option, right? Yeah. So you can either see them <laughs> on these two days or if you can't, then they need to see somebody else. Um, yeah. But it's nice that you still have that contact with them. So yeah, that's, ex that's exciting that hopefully it's a, a partnership that can work out. Yeah, hopefully. Um, yeah, and we can support each other because like you know, and like a lot of us know, being out there on your own is tough, isn't it? And it can sometimes um, sometimes be really good because sometimes I like being on my own and not talking to anyone. <laughs> but then sometimes we need the support, don't we? We all need the support. And the you do. I mean, I can remember days when I was by myself, you know, so when I didn't have anyone and I had a three-week waiting list. And, um, and then I was sick or, you know, my daughter yeah. was sick. And when you've got a three-week waiting list, you can't actually take a day off because you can't fit those patients that need to be seen now. You can't, you can't see them in four weeks' time. So I, I remember, I mean, I remember working just like being so ill and actually just having to work because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and so when you're in that situation where you – you know, you, you just, there's nothing that you can do. It's, yeah, it's really hard. It really, really is hard. Um, it's nice to have someone who, you know, if it, whatever happens, if there's an emergency, you've got someone to lean back on. And yeah. also somebody just to chat with cases, you know. Yeah. I remember when um, when I expanded my team and I had other uh, vets working for me, it was great just to get them in and say, hey, why don't you just have a look at this? Like, you know, this is a tricky case. Like, I'm just getting another opinion from my colleague and then just have a chat about it and see, you know, have you seen this before? Especially when it's something that's you know, different. Um, but it is, it's, it's so hard on your own. Um, and that's why we've created all our vet rehabbers Facebook groups. Um, so for all of you vet rehabbers out there, so that you don't feel like you're on your own ever. We don't want anyone to ever feel like they're on their own. Um, no. So you can, you can always reach out to us, please. If, you, if you're having one of those moments where you feel like, oh, I'm on my own. I don't have any support. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can reach out to us. So Felicity, you also are um, doing some educating, um, which is always exciting. I love it when vet rehabbers get into education. Um, so you have a course that you, you teach. Tell us about it. Yeah, so the idea from the course actually must have been came about about three years ago. I was asked to do a chat about complementary therapies, um, a guest lecture to um, a cohort of veterinary nurses at one of the um, local colleges near me. Um, yeah, because which I thought was really nice because they're expanding and looking at complementary therapy within their curriculum. So that was fab. But actually when I did the lecture, it was almost like a light bulb came on. The, the vet nurses are in the forefront, aren't they? They're right on the battleground to capturing all these clients that sometimes if we're not working directly in practice or in small animal uh, vets, we, sometimes can lose whereas the vet nurses are there on on the forefront and they can sort of capture those clients or recognize that these clients need rehab before it gets too late or before it gets yeah really complicated um so that was one of the things but also working within um small animal practice a lot of i found i don't know if it's the same anywhere else but in in the uk a lot of the vet nurses are doing bits and bobs of rehab and like laser therapy or they yeah they've introduced um sort of working with the older dogs and trying to educate them on appropriate exercise or something like that um but not had really any formal training so around that so that's where the idea of the course came came to me really so it is um a basic introduction into small animal rehabilitation and practice development so specifically um for people um so veterinary nurses or canine hydrotherapists or massage therapists that want to expand or be more confident on, on um, giving extra bits to their service with regards to their, the rehabilitation of, a, of an animal. 
So a lot of the time also in hydrotherapy, the owners might ask the hydrotherapist, oh, how, how long do you think I need to be walking them for? When can I increase their walking? And if they're not seeing a physio or they're seeing someone else, you know, to guide them, then just having that confidence to, and that competent really to, to be able to guide their owners a bit more holistically. And how long is the course? So the course is 12 months. Um, yeah, and it's 90% online. Um, so all our theory and the anatomy and um, bits are online. So it's six modules. Um, and the fifth module is the um, practice techniques. And within that module, we have a five day um, practical workshop where we will get together. Um, now that COVID <coughs> has lifted, hopefully that's going to go ahead um, this year. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that's where we get hands on and we do our, our assessments and things like that. And then the last module is supporting um, the students back in their work placements. So identifying cases that are suitable. So, for example, if they're a vet nurse, identify, supporting them to identify suitable cases for rehab and um, then them supporting them to develop basic um treatment and basic giving them advice really so yeah so trying to get them to capture more more clients sooner so is sense. it mainly focused at people in the UK so like I'm just trying to think we have listeners from all over the world so if there was someone who wasn't UK based could they still do the course um you know the online and then come to the UK for that five-day practical session yeah, so they can, they can, there is that option. Um, because most of it is online, it's a bit more flexible. Um, it will just be coming to do the five day pr practical element, um, hands on. And then are there exams that they have to do? <laughs> yeah, so there's an exam, they have to pass every module. So there's different types of assessment that we will, um, that they will go through. So there's um, written case studies, there's practical exam, and there's essays, and there's um, a Viva that we've done over um, Skype um, and online. Yeah, so there's different assessment elements to, to the course. Great. So um, for the listeners, we'll put the URL of that course in the description. So if anyone's interested um, or if they have any questions, where can they get hold of you? Yeah, so people can email me on sussexvps at gmail.com. So yeah, feel free to email me any questions about the course or if you want um, the link to the course outline and the modules um, objectives and things like that to give you a bit more of an idea of what the course covers and how it is laid out, then yeah, definitely drop me an email and we can provide you with some info. Great. So we'll put the email address as well as the link um, in the description for the listeners. And you're also quite passionate about helping um, vet rehab therapists, right, in building their practices and growing their practices. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's sort of born out of having the students from the um, vet physio courses. So that has actually grown um, as as I've been in practice, you know, maybe I've had one here and there, but now I have students regularly and it's <clears throat> from through working with them and also knowing yourself when you first graduate, often you're just thrown out there and that and then and then you're like, now what? What do I do? <laughs> so it's yeah, it's through that building people's confidence and supporting people um, in their practices to develop confidence and to yeah and to progress their rehab skills and um yeah move forward in their practices so we'll definitely have to get you on our business vet rehabbers facebook group to do a facebook live so we'll organize that um so for those of you that are in that group have a look out um hopefully we'll get felicity on and um yeah she can help you with some tips and advice but let's see before we end is there anything when you look back and at the years of practicing, anything that you would change or any regrets that you had? I wouldn't say any regrets. I think everything that you do is makes you who you are 
now today in this so looking back some some things were hard but I think it molds you into the therapist that you are today um when I first started I knew again this is the other thing about supporting new graduates or people coming through and wanting to in increase their skills and they're out there on their own I, I went and um, did 18 months alongside someone when I first qualified because that's how well I felt inside um and then so I was I moved completely all the way up to the top of the country and was on my own completely and at that time although I was working with someone I didn't have my family and friends or know the area so at that time there was a little bit of hesitation but I think when I did finally come down and then build my own practice it, it's it's your journey isn't it it's your journey that you takes you takes you on you build your confidence you build your um your skills and yeah it brings you to where you are today so no regrets what do you think your biggest challenge has been definitely having the children <laughs> balancing kids and and work yeah it's Bal the one. balance yeah and yeah and I think it and as soon as you have children it does change you changes your mindset it's not all about you it, it, you know you've got to have a certain amount of income coming in you've got to provide for this because it's not just you now there's other people to think about um but then on the other hand they do drive you and they strive you forward and they make you want to have a better life for the, for everyone yeah and what's your one piece of advice that you would give to vet rehabbers who are just coming into the field don't be scared to reach out to us and talk to us we're here to support you and we're here to help and and we all want to support each other we're all here and the same goal and yeah don't be worried about messaging anyone or getting jumping into one of the social media groups and just reading through the posts and then you know and then having your own posts yeah don't be scared about um getting involved awesome i love it reach reach out to that's what we're yeah. here for Bed yeah. efforts all over the world love it yeah Felicity, thank you so much for joining me. It's been wonderful chatting to you. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing how things progress with your practice. Thanks, Megan. It's been fab. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about veterinary rehabilitation. For more information about continuing education for vet rehab therapists that you can do online, you can go to onlinepetal.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course thank our sponsors Pulse Vet. We thank them for their commitment to their mission to improve the quality of life of the animals that we all love by developing, validating and providing advanced shockwave therapy at the highest level of support and service. Remember you can reach them at pulsevet.com or info at pulsevet.com. See you all next week.